giving a briefing by the Department of Science and Innovation and Training, sorry, Department of Science and Innovation um, and the Technology Innovation Agency, TIA, on commercialization of innovations by youth entrepreneurs with a focus on grassroots innovation programs and technology acquisition and the deployment fund. Um, I'd like to note at this point, apologies from Shanaz, if she's, any, if she's received any apologies. Good morning, Chair, and all on the platform. So the apologies we received were from the member side. It's Marcy Bia. She has a clash with another committee meeting that she's attending. And then we have an apology from Ms. King from the DA. Um, and from the ministry side, uh, the minister accompanied by the DGs abroad on official business. So those are the apologies that we've recorded. Um, thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Shanaz. Um, so at this point, I'd then like to hand over to Dr. Moafe, um, who will then lead the delegation from the department and from TIA this morning. We had, we had hoped, honorable members, for us to also robe in other, um, you know, uh, um, entities within government or departments. We had, I think, Shanaz hoped to maybe robe in trade and industry and maybe the NYDA as an agency that is also, uh, you know, playing a pivotal role in supporting um, young entrepreneurs and hoping that there are some innovations that they are supporting um, in understanding comprehensively, you know, a possible network that exists in terms of how we are all trying to support the commercialization of innovations by young uh, South Africans, uh, young entrepreneurs. And so, um, unfortunately, we weren't able to coordinate, you know, these other partners, uh, um, Dr. Moafe, but it's it's I you know it's our ideal as a committee to always try and see where the synergies are and close the gaps, um, you know, so that we we have a comprehensive understanding of exactly what is being done. Um, I don't know, Shanaz, if we did communicate in terms of uh, getting briefings from beneficiaries and so forth for today, but I'll hear from Dr. Moafe how colleagues uh, intend on approaching today's briefing. If we don't. <clears throat> If we didn't uh, coordinate um, beneficiaries like we've been doing of late, it's still okay. I mean, it's something that we can still do in future engagements. But I think generally that's the approach we're also taking right now. It kind of gives us a feel when we have beneficiaries or leaders of key projects, um, what it does, it, it sort of gives us a feel of being on physical oversight because you're able to uh, have this, interaction with people who are actually doing the work, people who are actually benefiting. And so it doesn't make it feel like a mere presentation from the department, um, but it, it really gives us a, a better understanding of, of what is happening. Um, so that's, the, that's just generally the approach around that, Dr. Moafe, but let me hand over to you at this point in time and uh, to, to then lead the delegation from the department as well as from TIA. Thank you. I don't know if it's my sound, but um, you're not you're not coming through yet, and your mic is open. I think so. I'm not sure what's causing the silence, but your mic is open, but we can't hear you. Maybe if you close the mic and open it again. All right, Shanaz, can I check on your side? Is it my network or? No, Chair, it... I think it's something to do with this mic. I don't know, maybe it's this volume or something. Yeah, because of the, I don't know what to call them, the vibrations in the mic, your mic is flat. There's no sound coming through your mic. So maybe let's log out. Maybe you can log out and log back in. We'll just give you some time, colleagues, if we can just give Dr. Moffa some time uh, to just sort out his device.
good morning, honorable members. Chairperson, can you hear me? Loud and clear. Great stuff. I just decided to use another gadget. Um, now, thanks very much, and I, I really also appreciate your, your, your patience. Uh, I'm just going to introduce the team that I'm with. Uh, from the TIA side, if they've already joined, is the um, uh, acting CEO of TIA, uh, Mr. Patrick Krapi. And then I've also got Anita, who is actually the manager responsible for implementing the, um, the programs that we're presenting today. From the DIA side, side, I've got Mr. Tsepang Musia, who's the director responsible for uh, also the programs from the department side and his deputy. Um, Mr. Ephraim Palafana. I probably would uh, then uh, just uh, start to go through the introduction. I don't know who else in the department. I haven't been able to check the names after having to deal with the, um, with the, with the connection issues. Uh, Chairperson, you have raised a number of uh, interesting issues around the preparations for, for this uh, briefing today. One of them including being able to have the uh, actual beneficiaries as part of this presentation, which we didn't do and which we would have really loved to do, uh, especially because this also gives us an opportunity for some reflections uh, that could um, show us things that sometimes we don't see when we engage, but we, we would be more than happy because uh, these programs have shown to be quite impactful in, in, in the communities and in the young people in general. The one thing that you also uh, highlight, uh, Chairperson, is how we need to start working towards uh, coordination within government. And this is really one of the biggest provisions of the decadal plans. When we are looking at the decadal plans as a, 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 a strategy that is going to use the whole government approach. Now, what we have started to do with programs like this is where they are based in a particular location, we also engage other stakeholders, whether it is um, in where it involves human settlements, then we'll be working with human settlements. And for some, we have already started involving uh, and partnering with uh, the um, you know, entities such as the um, uh, National Youth Development uh, Agency where they either use our infrastructure and, 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 and initiatives uh, to do other things, but also to provide uh, additional support to what we provide to young people. But coming back to today's presentation, we, we are going to share with the honorable members the two programs. And we need to also indicate here that there is much more than these two programs that we're presenting that we are doing in support of uh, young people and their entrepreneurship. It's just that the briefing was that we, we're gonna be looking at this uh, particular to, to program. Because they address what we call in the decadal plan, the issues of inclusivity, where we are looking at uh, youth empowerment, where we are looking at the, with issues of uh, ensuring programs, where we're also looking at what we call spatial distribution. In other words, looking at taking our initiatives to rural provinces and rural areas and also to the townships. So we therefore are quite excited about the trajectory that this program is starting to take. And with that, I'm just going to uh, hand over to, to Anita with your permission so that um, she can start taking us through the, the, the presentation. Anita, are you here with us? Or let me just hand over to Patrick and then uh, if there's any few words you wanna say before letting Anita speak, then we'll take it that way. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Mofe. Uh, our CEO, uh, unfortunately, sent his apologies. He's not able to be here. He has a funeral in the family, but he is uh, being represented by Mr. Vusi Skwasana and Mr. Garth Williams. And uh, good morning, uh, honorable members and uh, chairperson. I'm just gonna share my screen and take you through the presentations. Uh, may I have an, a confirmation that uh, the presentation is visible on your side? We can see it, thanks. 
Okay, thank you very much. It's visible. Uh, thank you. Thank you. So I will start with the grassroots innovation program and then I'll take you through the technology acquisition and deployment fund. So the grassroots innovation program is a strategic invention of the DSI to support the needs of grassroots innovators. It has specific policy intents as outlined in the white paper. And in, in, in particular, it's, uh, the intents are around supporting grassroots innovators or grassroots innovation, increasing the focus on inclusivity and transformation and enhancing the innovation culture in society and government. Now, uh, this program was initiated in 2016. Uh, it ran for two years at the CSRR, uh, where it was piloted at the CSRR with four innovators in three provinces. Uh, thereafter, it was uh, transferred to TIA in 2019, and the mandate was to scale up the program and roll it out nationally. The program targets individuals who develop innovations to solve challenges using local resources and capabilities through working outside the realm of formal innovation institutions. So these are innovators that don't have access to formal innovation institutions, may not have heard of a CSR before or a science council or a research institution before. The program, the program forms part of interventions intended to support development and commercializations of innovations for tackling unemployment, poverty, and inequality through innovation. Um, in terms of the objectives of the program, it supports solutions that have uh, a market need or a potential to address community challenges. In particular, uh, we were given uh, an, um, a mandate by the department to identify grassroots innovators across all the provinces, provide access to a range of interventions, including funding and business development, assist the innovators to enhance their innovation skills, uh, and their in innovations and enable them to progress towards pre-commercialization, profile and showcase their innovations. Uh, through, the, this, uh, through the pilot program at CSR and subsequent discussions at TIA, we were able to come to a multi-support uh, package, uh, providing grant funding of 260,000, which uh, would assist the innovators in idea development, business model, business and technical skills training, networking, technical prototype development through either the TR technology stations or any other structure that they can access expertise and infrastructure. Mentorship, we have established a mentorship platform at TIA where they are onboarded onto a platform and are receiving mentoring and coaching and dealing with compliance and regulatory issues. Uh, in terms of the portfolio uh, performance, uh, we have currently 139 innovators in the program. Uh, we I have recently onboarded uh, uh, 28 of them. So uh, we take them through uh, what we call an innovation value chain, where we would look at their feasibility, then put them through a research and development process, help them with the development of the technology, assist them with product testing, and then piloting. Thus far, we have 15 projects that are active in the market, and we have these projects have raised 13.8 million follow-on funding uh, from the initial support of uh, 260,000 that we have given them. In terms of the sectors and demographics, uh, we are present in all nine provinces. Uh, unfortunately, uh, there seems to be a dominance in Kauteng uh, in terms of uh, the, the, the pie chart that you see. We still have a lot of work to do in the Northern Cape, in Limpopo, the Eastern Cape, Pomalanga, uh, Northwest, uh, even the Western Cape and KZN numbers are also looking quite, quite low. Uh, we, we also fund across all sectors and there's a dominance around the ICT sectors. A lot of apps comes through, a lot of uh, software, uh, software development, software products, but we do have projects in all uh, economic sectors. Uh, in terms of gender, we have about 30% female and 70% uh, male. It's not a good reflection. We are looking at specific interventions to help increase the participation of females in the program. In terms of race, a uh, majority, about 90% are African with uh, uh, smaller percentages, uh, white, Indian, and colored. Through the program, we've also managed to establish several partnerships. Uh, one of the bigger partners uh, partnerships are, is with the Insurance Sector Education and Training Authority in CETA. 
through this, we uh, managed to come through, uh, come and develop a program for the grassroots innovators at 17.5 million, where we're looking at supporting 20 innovative solutions in the insurance and insurance related sectors, especially uh, those sectors that have been affected by the 4IR and by COVID. Through the Department of Tourism, we're also funding 20 technologies uh, in the tourism sectors, and these are unemployed youth uh, to help them to develop their products, create startups, and move into the economy. Through the Industrial Development Corporation, we have engaged with them to provide follow-on funding uh, through their program, the Grassroots Innovation Facilitation Scheme. Uh, this program is, uh, is taking a bit slow to take off, uh, but some of our projects have been through the due diligence process uh, for follow-on funding. We have a partnership with the SAB Foundation where we look at uh, where we look at joint funding of innovation, and uh, the partnership is valued at 18 million. Thus far, uh, in this uh, in this year, we're supporting 22 companies jointly through this partnership. Uh, we also have a partnership with the UNDP, uh, to which is collaborating with the City of Shuane and the Innovation Hub to support grassroots innovators that can be piloted at the City of Shuane. Uh, through the ESCOM Expo partnership, we are looking at supporting school learners uh, to, uh, to develop their innovative technologies. And on a yearly basis, we take between 20 to 30 learners who have innovation projects. We expose them through a bootcamp and thereafter they submit their application for funding. And we have a very uh, streamlined application process. It's a very simple process. They submit a one page by graphic information, a video, and a presentation. And it's, it's, it's a process that's working. It's enabling grassroots innovators to access uh, the instrument. Uh, through the district development model initiatives, we partnered with Ubu and Dis uh, Zululand district municipalities to support youth innovators. Uh, here, we, we're intending to support 10 innovators from each of these districts. Uh, the last one is a new uh, partnership. Uh, we've just had recent discussions on this with the Eskom Development Foundation, where the Eskom De Foundation is looking to make a deed of donation to support deployment of grassroots technologies to communities for socioeconomic upliftment and skills development. Uh, in terms of the high level impact of the program, we have approved 119, 39 projects since, uh, since 2019. We have leveraged 20.3 million. Uh, the projects themselves have raised 13.8 million. We have 40 innovation products that have been developed in terms of prototypes, uh, intellectual property, demonstrations, et cetera. 18 new companies have been created. 15 products are currently in the market. And uh, uh, from last financial year, we started counting the jobs and 22 new jobs were created uh, since the program started. Um, I would have loved to have these innovators to actually come and present, but uh, Chair, I will just take you through a few of the, uh, of the innovators that we wanted to profile. Uh, the first one is the smart lane transport solution. The innovator is Wasusiwe and Dibana, and uh, she's got a solution for the taxi industry uh, her solution is called Street Governor. It's a transport intelligence system design, uh, designed to help stabilize the mini bus taxi industry. Uh, so this is a vol very volatile industry, but she's 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 quite uh, brave and she's she's come up with a solution to provide a set of decision support tools to various stakeholders that makes the uh, business of the taxi industry work. The system narrows the traf trust deficit by improving transparency, accountability, and profitability. She is currently in negotiations with Santaco and is signing an equity deal, equity deal with, with Santaco uh, to roll out this technology. Santaco actually has adopted uh, her innovation as a special, as part of their special project. Uh, she has, uh, in October, uh, done, uh, by October, sorry, 2023, intending to complete all biometrics and general information of the taxi industry members. Uh, and she is, uh, by November, intending to complete the regulatory compliance monitoring. So uh, this is one of the, uh, the technologies. It's, it's one of our flagship technologies uh, that has come through this program. Uh, Golden 
Itumalang Masheko is working in the tourism sector in the art and craft industry. He's created the online store uh, at, the Kruger, at the Kruger National Park. And the intention is to, uh, to digitize the craft industry by placing these uh, uh, the, 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 the crafters onto his platform. And he's uh, received funding from TIA and the Department of Tourism. But in addition, he's negotiating uh, a deal with the, with the Kruger National Park uh, to load uh, 70, uh, 70 crafters onto the platform. Uh, it's, uh, the deal is in the, round of, in the region of 600,000 rands. He's also currently uh, in talks with a number of uh, several departments like CEDA, Department of Culture, Sports and Recre Recreation in terms of onboarding local crafters onto his platform. Um, Credit Peak is the next innovator, uh, promote Penchalia. He is, uh, his product is looking at financial inclusion and, and assisting, uh, uh, assisting uh, the particularly the indigent communities to get an alternate credit scoring. And uh, he does this by providing, uh, by providing uh, solar power. He has a, a, a company called iSolar. He's using energy as an enabler to assist communities to improve their, their, their credit scoring and therefore become uh, part of uh, financial, uh, be better financially included in products and services. Uh, he is currently uh, in several partnerships. Uh, but he's recently traveled to Rwanda and he will be deploying his uh, product there. And uh, the Rwandan uh, government has provided him with a 10 million rand deal to deliver his product in, in Rwanda. Uh, Tabiso Tiro uh, 24 seven printing station uh, is a user-friendly and self-serviced print, photocopy, fax, email, scan, mobile typing, cloud storage and internet services through a system that looks like an ATM. So basically you could go to an ATM and you could print out a document and there'd be a, a, payment, service, a payment service there. He is currently fine tuning the, the project and looking uh, to, to deploy the product, uh, pro, uh, project at Ngaka Mulema District Municipality Police Station and the local municipal, municipality offices. Uh, Brendan Fernandez uh, technology is called Graphin Tech. He is, he's got an artificial intelligence solution looking at big data and analytics. And uh, it looks at an end-to-end -end business intelligent driven fleet management solution. The solution connects uh, multiple internet of things, enable devices and sensors. Example, the GPS tracking device, fuel sensors, temperature sensors, onboard video camera, et cetera, to collect data uh, of interest from vehicles. Uh, incidentally, Brendan is currently 26 years old. Uh, it's, it's, this amazing technology has now been adopted by the city of Joburg. Uh, he won the city of Joburg Smart City Innovation Challenge, and he secured the opportunity to pilot this technology for the pickup fleets, which collects waste from over 3 million households and 17,000 businesses around the city of Joburg. Uh, so he received funding through the, through the grassroots program and some additional funding from TIA and a commitment from, from the city of Joburg for an additional 500,000 to roll out the project uh, for, the pick, uh, for pick it up and waste collection. Uh, more hygiene, uh, hand hygiene assistant by uh, Sipuwe P. It's, uh, it is He developed a system it's an intelligent hand sanitation station that acts as a preventative uh, intervention against the spread of communicable diseases and infectious germs. So basically it's a people management system and it's a, it's a system in hospitals uh, to be placed in hospitals. Uh, generally you would find that uh, uh, there is close monitoring of uh, making sure that, uh, that nurses and, 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 and medical staff sanitize uh, before they move from patient to patient. Now, it's main, it may not be happening uh, in hospitals. So this system enables the monitoring of, uh, of sanitizing and, and, and making sure that they keep to hygiene protocols in hospitals. Uh, he's currently also being supported uh, by Innovate Durban. He's based in Durban. He's uh, currently being supported by Innovate Durban as well to assist with, uh, with the commercialization. 
Uh, MTEMP is a solution in the tourism sector, and it's a hospitality staffing chatbot platform that will be used by temporary job seekers and by hospitality businesses or enterprise client. And this will enable uh, a coordination of job seekers with, within the hospitality industry. Uh, currently, the, the, the product has been developed and it's ready for, for piloting. And it is being piloted in Township Internet, Internet Cafe Network Partners for job seeker recruitment and advertising within local township communities. Um, and my last uh, innovator is Lisa von Beneka. She's uh, from the Eastern Cape. Uh, she's developed a technology that uses clean alternative solution. And what she is doing is she is taking, uh, she is making solar blinds. So blinds for windows uh, will be made with solar panels. And these uh, solar panels are coming from waste materials. Uh, she's currently still in development. And uh, the next step will be to pilot the solar blind and develop the online profile and, 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 help, and help grow her team. Uh, Mary, Mary Jane Mpashlele is has a smart panic solution. And uh, the solution is on, found on devices, smartwatches and tags. She has an, a mobile app and a web-based platform for GPS tracking and SOS panicking. And uh, it, also, uh, it also includes animal tracking and asset tracking uh, for logistic companies. Uh, she is currently uh, currently in the market, uh, and she's piloting uh, improved versions of her product uh, in 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 other areas. Uh, DDG and Chairperson, I'd like to stop there on the grassroots program. And uh, uh, Anita, I suggest that you just take the second presentation as well, and then we close up. Uh... Okay, thank you. Just give me a okay. second. Uh, please, can you confirm, DDG, if you can see my presentation? I can see it, but uh, yes, it's now sorted in, in presentation mode. Thanks, you can proceed. Okay, thank you. So I'll take a few minutes to talk about the Technology Acquisition and Deployment Fund. Uh, so uh, this fund was uh, contracted in 2018 to TIA to establish an instrument. And the purpose of the instrument was to facilitate deployment and uptake of locally developed technologies by government to improve service delivery and support the commercialization of these technologies. In this way, the instrument also served as a mechanism where procurement of local innovation is supported and made easier. And this instrument emanated from a cabinet decision in 2016 uh, that was made that, should, that there should be a dedicated procurement spend for locally developed technologies. Furthermore, the white paper on science and technology supports an enabling environment for deployment of uh, locally developed technologies. Um, so the intent of the TADF is to enable government to be the first customer or the first acquirer of locally developed technologies uh, at all levels, national, provincial, and local. It also, uh, it's also aims to facilitate commercialization and market entry, as well as uptake by both private and public sector. And the technologies are aimed to improve service delivery, operational efficiencies, and to address persistent socioeconomic challenges. Now, the TADF uh, was developed uh, through uh, jointly through TIA, TIA and the DSI after looking at a number of international uh, programs uh, that do similar things. So there has been uh, quite an intensive uh, research done around looking at what other countries do in this area. And the closest that uh, the TADF speaks to is what is called the Small Business and Innovation Research Program, which a number of countries are deploying. And I'm just gonna pick on a few of them. Uh, in the US, uh, it is the most well-known program for utilizing government spend to stimulate technology development, acquisition and deployment. And it is a legislated instrument. So the intent around the TADF, uh, currently we are piloting it, but the intent is at some point it becomes a legislated instrument like the way it's being done in the, in the US. For an example, uh, for, for uh, governments, federal governments with a budget of $100 million, there's a 2.8% actually allocated for the development of innovative solutions by SMMEs to support their respective mandates. 
A similar program is found in Australia. In India, I think the Indian program is the closest uh, that we've come to the to how the TADF was conceptualized for South Africa. Uh, and in India, it's called the Technology Acquisition and Development Fund. Um, so India also spends a portion of the budget for the development of the technology. In the UK, it's similar and it positions government as a lead customer for technology products or services. In, uh, uh, in our case, in the TADF, we've conceptualized it along four modes. The first mode is the market pusher mode which means that the innovator applies to the TADF and the innovator has a technology solution for deployment to an identified client. So it's quite important to point, point out that when the innovator comes to us, he already has a client who is a government department who has given him a letter of intent to say that they are willing to deploy the technology in that uh, government department. Uh, mode two is what we call a market push approach here, the, the client or the user is the applicant. So this will be the government department and they have identified an innovator or, that, or the solution for acquisition and deployment. And we currently are not implementing mode two. Uh, we're just doing this in the phase approach. We are implementing mode one and we are looking into implementing mode three within the, uh, in this financial year. Uh, mode three is where the applicant uh, uh, is a government department. He has a challenge, uh, they have a challenge and requires a technology solution, but they've not identified who the innovator is uh, for this particular solution. So we are currently busy uh, with implementation of the mode three. And the last mode is mode four, which is the market pull approach. And here the SMME is the applicant of, uh, for acquisition of a technology. So basically it's the private sector that is, uh, is interested in acquiring a technology which they have identified in a science council or university for deployment. And this deployment can happen in a public or the private sector. So for an example, a private sector SMME may come to say that they have, uh, they, they want to apply to this fund because they've identified a very interesting solution at a university, which they would assist to deploy this in a government department. Uh, but we have we are not at that stage as, as yet in terms of our implementation. Uh, the funding parameters, uh, the, the technology must be, have reached sufficient level of maturity. So unlike the grassroots innovation program where it's an early access instrument, uh, technology still need to develop. In this case, the technology must be mature and is ready for deployment in the market. Uh, we provide a maximum of a million rand to support the deployment and these will include market testing, demonstration, and validation activities. And uh, we, we normally offer them a two-year contracts uh, to complete the projects. And in most cases, the projects are completed within a year. And the applicant must have identified the potential customer and the end user, which is the government department or the municipality. Uh, currently, we have 18 projects in our portfolio, all through mode one. Uh, uh, in this, uh, in the project, in the portfolio, we have uh, unfortunately 39% uh, um, youth, 61% uh, are non youth, 83% uh, black owned, 22% uh, female, and uh, the technologies, these 18 technologies are currently going to be deployed in about six provinces. Uh, just want to talk about some of the interesting technologies, uh, and this is quite appropriate since this is Disability Month. We have a technology by Jabo Blose. So Jabo is uh, he has a disability. He he is deaf, and uh, he's has an experience where he when he goes to a police station to report an incident or he goes to home affairs uh, for for documentation etc that there is no interpreter that will be able to communicate with the, with the people on the other side in terms of the service he needs. So he's come up with the platform uh, and it's remotely connects deaf people to qualified sign language interpreters in real time, enabling them to communicate more effectively and gain access to information and services and thus increase accessibility to the services, education, health, safety, and a whole, my right of social benefits. 
the project, uh, the company is called Viapom, and he is currently through the TADF will be deploying the technology in five SAPS uh, police stations in Kauteng. Uh, this will be in Tembisa, Brooklyn, Orange Farm, Joburg Central, uh, Soweto, uh, Morocco in Soweto over a 12 month period. And uh, yeah, day after there is some keen interest from the, from the police station to actually uh, roll this out further. So you may notice that there is a logo from the SAPS here, and that is because Viacom has a letter of intent from the Johannesburg police station, accounting police station to roll it out in these five SAPS uh, police stations. Uh, Sasanda App Universe is, uh, has been in the fund, uh, the program for, for uh, about nine months now. And Sasanda App uh, Universe is, uh, is a virtual science laboratory that uses the power of the camera and real-time 3D content to provide learners with an opportunity to experiment anywhere, anytime. And Sasanda App Universe works with physically produced products, uh, as well as the, uh, the, the ICT solution. And he is currently uh, deploying the technology in the Kauteng Department of Education, Kudalani District, KwaZulu-Natal Department of Education, and Slitazana Circuit Management. And he is in, uh, he has deployed technology in, in uh, several schools. Some of the feedback that has come through is students and teachers have enhanced their learning experience through this app make it more interactive and increasing learner participation in the subject. He's made this technology available to five schools and approximately 500 users through the, through the program. He's procured 80 tablets for schools that do not have the access to tablets. And he's procured these cubes for five schools and he's pre-installed the app on 150 smart devices. And this is uh, some of the images of what it looks like uh, in terms of when students interact with the app. Uh, the next uh, project is DSM Communicator by Mr. Subasiso Mbata. Uh, this is um, uh, a solution, particularly for township schools, uh, where uh, it focuses on digital inclusion and neglected township community. DSM Communicator takes into account the conditions of the township school operates under and the level of technology literacy of, uh, of their users. And this platform is to improve communication between parents and learners. Uh, so uh, may, many uh, private schools and uh, other well-established Model C schools do have a system, but uh, this, that system is unaffordable and, and, and does not work for the township schools. So through this TADF, uh, Subasiso has come up with a solution. He is currently deployed the solution in 15 KZN schools. Um, and uh, he's, um, some of the users is, uh, the user feedback is parents have become more responsive to the request for the parent teacher meetings. Generally, that's quite a problem to get parents to come to meetings. Uh, communication on the school to parents are more clear and accurate. For an example, things like homework requests uh, are sent directly to the par parents without the use of condition, conventional paper written requests. And this is some of the, the, the interfaces with the, with the solution or with the platform uh, that the school has. The school has found it quite uh, easy to adopt this, this solution. Um, Keda, Keda device uh, is by T-Host uh, Tisane, and this is a technology that assists visually impaired individuals. Uh, so many of you uh, that are fully sighted uh, are able to comfortably use a, a smartphone, but for people that are digitally impaired, uh, there is no, uh, there, there is nothing on the smartphone that will help you to maneuver uh, your apps or to be able to get to so, uh, certain solutions. So TIHO has developed a device that uh, assists uh, visually impaired individuals to uh, navigate uh, the controls, controls and apps of their smartphones without the use, uh, without the need of using the touch screen of the smartphone. And uh, he intends uh, through this uh, program, the TADF is to manufacture 300 of the devices and purchase 100 smartphones for those visually impaired who don't have smartphones. 50 of these devices will be deployed in KZN and uh, the remaining devices will be deployed uh, at the uh, 
Shlama Long Blind Association uh, in the free state. Um, I think Memeza Community Safety is a well uh, known project. This is uh, a project that uh, provides uh, through a, a community response model. It helps to strengthen communities impacted by gender based uh, violence, violence, and crime with the ability to broadcast the need for assistance to local support networks such as the police station or the community policing forum and community members, enabling citizen to citizen policing. Currently, uh, Memeza is being deployed in the Ubu district uh, and it's being deployed in, uh, in uh, uh, they, they are installing 349 community alarms uh, over, a, over an 18 month period and they have a strong relationship both with the Ubu district as well as uh, the SAPS at, at Hibidin uh, for the deployment of this technology. Uh, Smart Water Tank uh, is, a, is a project that has, uh, that has moved from grassroots innovation into the TADF. And this is a water storage tank that has been designed, designed in a regular shape and it's modular so you can add uh, to the tank, uh, different units. It's it's like a like you put a puzzle together. It allows the tank to be installed in numerous layouts as well as positioned on any one of the three sides. And so basically, it will be a Georgia tank, but it's a tank that you can install indoor or outdoor. It has a compact design, and it serves as a standalone rain and harvesting unit uh, if roofs are not available. And uh, thirty of these tanks will be deployed at a police station in KZN and in a community hall uh, as part of the TADF. Uh, Aquacura is a water solution, a water purifying solution uh, that is a mobile uh, water sterilizing unit, self-contained and lockable and easy to operate. It actually uh, will operate at the source of water and it helps to purify, uh, to purify water. The solution will be deployed in the KZN Ubu district municipality as part of the district development model uh, projects. Uh, Prevlik is a solution by Tulani. Uh, Tulani's uh, solution is a smart manhole cover that has uh, Internet of Things sensors to detect when sewage lines are blocked and report such anomalies uh, using the Plumber app and municipal management system. Definitely something that Durban could use now. Uh, he's developed this app uh, uh, to report uh, clean water leaks as, as in an effort to promote ease of reporting and to speed up service delivery. He also was part of the Joburg City Innovation Challenge and he also was awarded 500,000 rands in addition to the TAFDF funding to deploy the technology, uh, these manhole covers uh, for, the, for the city of Joburg um, in, in, in various areas. Moonshine is a project uh, by Memphis. Um, Memphis uh, is uh, he's created a reflective paint in the form of spray designed to make stray animals visible at night. The main objective is to reduce and avoid accidents caused by stray animals. And uh, Memphis uh, currently has a partnership with the Road Accident Fund where these uh, technologies are being deployed in rural areas. Through the TADF, he will deploy uh, 12,000 units in the Eastern Cape, KZN, and the Northwest, and thereafter move into Botswana, Lesotho, Swaziland, and Namibia. He is being also assisted, as I mentioned, by the Road Accident Fund uh, in, in terms of deploying and, and deploying more of the solution. Um, low-cost geyser by, uh, by Matt. Uh, this is a low-cost water geyser that offers numerous benefits to all low-income households, and uh, Matt uh, intends to deploy the technology, 40 units of the technology in Polokwane and in the Nice district, together with the local, together with local communities. Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson and DDG. That's the end yeah. of the question. Thanks very, very much, Anita, and uh, Chairperson and uh, Honorable Members. Th this is really just, as we indicated, uh, the two instruments that we're using, there, there are others. And, and I think just really to, as the chairperson has said, just to really feel the actual uh, uh, um, 
vibe of the impact of this kind of work is when you really interact with the actual entrepreneurs. Some of them seeing where they're coming from and what they have been able to develop. And, and we, we, we're quite excited about it. We know that it probably doesn't cover everything that we need covered, but it is really, in my view, one area that uh, we, we intend to, to grow. One of the common things that you have seen in all of them is that these initiatives are starting to help us to strengthen partnerships that in the past we couldn't have. You know, for example, where the innovation is supporting perhaps the work that is being done by um, social uh, development partners, then you start seeing them coming on board. Uh, you know, exciting initiatives such as those uh, for the visually impaired people, the, the CADA system, uh, where actually you see a smartphone talking to the person. So, so those are some of the initiatives that we find in, we are also beginning to um, enter into areas that it was difficult for us to, to do in the past, uh, such as really looking at issues of looking at technologies that will be developed with and for uh, people with disabilities. So uh, I'm going to stop it at that. And um, with your guidance, uh, Chairperson, we will then um, deal with whatever issues of clarity and other questions that you may raise. Thanks very much. Uh, uh, maybe, Tepang, do you want to add anything? Yes, maybe I can quickly mention uh, some few points here, DDG, and thank you very much. Um, what you are doing with these two instruments is to pilot them as experiments and also as models for us to create um, income opportunities and job opportunities. So we are beginning to interrogate now as you have seen a number of them are to do with service delivery or, or addressing crime or automating a particular uh, 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 service in, in, in a government department or in a municipality. But behind uh, 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 the work you are seeing, we are asking ourselves, how do we sustain these as models to expand and create more jobs? So the numbers you would have seen on the TATF are higher because each TATF uh, project up to a maximum of uh, about 1 million rents, but you'll find that there's an absorptive capacity to employ about six or seven people. At the back now, we are saying, how do we sustain that? What are the subscription models to sustain uh, those kind of um, uh, jobs so that when these things are replicated and scaled up, there is a critical mass of uh, young people who are able to, to, to secure uh, jobs and sustain themselves. Thank you very much, uh, TDG. Thanks, Tabang, and then I think it's over to, to the chairperson now. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Moafe, and to colleagues from the department as well as from TIA. Um, I, I, I really, as members indicate their interest to participate, I really think we could have tried, um, like we did with the previous pre um, engagements, to bring in the actual um, innovators. Um, I think, for example, when you look at the second presentation, which really highlights um, some really exciting work that's being done, uh, you know, and 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 you've you know been able to profile these colleagues. Um, quite well, but it would have been great for us to have one or two of them uh, come to the committee like we did with the other, uh, I think the last two briefings to the committee have been of that nature. So let's let's really please try and work on that. Uh, I know ideally we want to be going to um, these programs, but we know that time is not on our side. Uh, we know the limitations coming from the midterm review, we know the limitations of the committee. So if we really can uh, proactively as a department, Dr. Moafe, if we can just take that back to the team, if we can proactively uh, take into consideration this plea by the committee to have, you know, these individuals um, come to the accompany yourselves to the committee. Then, I mean, I think <clears throat> really the, the cross uh, root innovation program is really exciting. Um, and it's really important in terms of the role that 
it can play in contributing to alleviating unemployment, uh, poverty and inequality. And I mean, for example, in the first presentation, you stressed the fact that uh, in terms of who you who uh, you you fund, I think it's slide um, slide for six. You say that we it ex the fund excludes students, researchers at formal higher education institutions, science councils that are part of a research group. And I think the intention there is to try and 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 make sure that you don't have the same people sort of benefiting and really ensuring that you're able to spread these resources into local communities and to people who don't have opportunities maybe coming from uh, um, higher education institutions. I just want to know that <clears throat> how do we deal with cases where we have people who have gone through the higher education system, particularly TVED students, you know, TVED students who have graduated, who have these skills, who have ideas of innovations that they can bring into uh, communities, but don't have the support. So are we able to include those, so graduates in particular, or, or would they also not be eligible for um, this fund? Uh, I also want to appreciate the, the reflection um, on the fact that in, in terms of our geographic spread um, uh, and spatial benefit, we are not doing so well um, with the density in Gauteng. And I mean, we know that you know, in terms of population, Gauteng is one of our most dense uh, provinces. However, we really need to work on ensuring a greater spread. And how do we, um, in a province like the Northern Cape, for example, where we are saying we're not doing well, um, and considering its vastness and considering, I mean, we did oversight there uh, this year, you know, how do we, how do we, how do we bring up that number? You know, how do we bring up that number? Um, it might not match that. It, we, we may never find ourselves where, you know, in each province there's a balance, of course. Um, but how do we bring up that number? What do we need to do? Um, so that that number uh, can be brought up and there can be greater opportunities for people living in the Northern Cape. I mean, because ideally from these grassroots projects, you also don't want it to benefit a small community, but you also want to think how can these pro projects um, or, you know, be scaled up for them to become national or domestic uh, uh, or impactful on, on a national level uh, and even maybe on an international level, right? So, so yeah. So I think for me that 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 acknowledgement around the demographics is important, um, but also to then say what do we do about that, right? So what plans do we put in place? What tangible plans um, do we put in place to up the numbers in the Northern Cape? Um, and is it possible? And what ecosystem needs to be created? Ecosystem of support needs to be created because it, 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 it might not be a, I always say that some of these things are not solely the responsibility of TIA or, or, or DSI. It might need some intervention from DBE. It might some, need some intervention. I mean, in this case, one, one would have loved to also understand the interface on this project with, for example, the Department of Trade and Industry. Um, you know, to, uh, and so and so, um, but but what target and what plan do we put in place to up those numbers? Um, yeah, because we need to be intentional about it. Um, we can't just say, yeah, you know, this is how the numbers look, and we are worried that you know they look like this. But what are, what are we saying? We're going to do about it. Um, yeah, I think I'll leave it at that for now. And uh, and then hand over to members. I saw a lot of hands go up. So I saw the hand of Honorable Boshoff. I see the hand of Honorable Mananiso. I think some hands dropped um, as time went by. Maybe Kikuli got kicked off, but I'll take those hands for now. Honorable Boshoff. Thank you, Honorable. Um, I'm just driving, so I had to pull off and uh, take the, the Bluetooth off so that they can be uh, more audible. The UC, it's a real me. 
Um, no, thank you very much uh, for the presentation. As always, it's uh, very informative and actually inspiring. Uh, I have two things that I would like to know. With our first, uh, well, engagement, I wanted to say encounter because it was a little bit of an encounter. But with our first engagement with Tia, uh, one of the problems uh, or challenges mentioned by Tia itself was that there's uh, quite a long lead time from the time that uh, an innovator applies until he or she knows what the um, result is, whether they will be uh, uh, funded or assisted or not. Um, I would like to know if uh, these programs, which was mentioned or were mentioned uh, today, if that um, improves uh, or has improved the, the lead times, uh, does it go faster now? Because I think that's maybe one of the biggest problems or potential problems that some really valuable innovations just, uh, you know, they just uh, disappear um, because the person can't wait for too long. That's the one thing that I would like to know. The other thing is if the uh, presenters, I don't know who exactly I'm asking it to, um, can give a kind of a magnitude of how much more money, but I don't want to say so many million or whatever, say double or triple or just a little bit more. How much more can TI in these programs actually absorb? Uh, meaning how many innovators are there? It, it, you know, it doesn't help that we say, let's vote 40 billion rand for um, Tia, the same amount that NISFAS currently gets, um, and then you don't have innovators. So I, I think we all uh, expect or agree that uh, Tia works on a strapped uh, budget and that it would really like uh, more money to assist more innovators. But how much money, uh, if you look at uh, current applications, how much money could, in fact, be uh, absorbed because the reason why I ask this is, um, you know, we really need more than this, uh, more of this. I mean, uh, this is what's what's going to uh, ignite economic growth. Uh, social spending is essential because it stops people from uh, dying and uh, really, you know, uh, bad levels of poverty, but this is what's going to lift people uh, out of it. And then just another thing that I would like to know, is there an active process of liaising with TVET colleges to say, okay, you students uh, you, and, and universities of technology and even other, I, is it part of this grassroots uh, project? Um, maybe I've just missed it. Um, so, so please, if you have said it, just say, say we've said it, then uh, uh, I'll understand. But uh, the idea that students go to these institutions with the idea will get, give me a job afterwards. And maybe while they're still very young and very creative and very enterprising, it is exactly the right time to, to get them to be entrepreneurs uh, with, with your assistance. Um, Okay, so that's the three things, and uh, hopefully I, I didn't uh, ask something that you actually told us. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Thank you, Honorable Poshov. Honorable Mananiso. Thank you. Chair, let me start by welcoming the presentation. And indeed, one must say that uh, the picture looks good. Uh, because most of the people that one have seen is young people and mostly from disadvantaged, you know, uh, race. Uh, Chairperson, I think on TVET and universities in this particular programs, it is important. And I just wanted to check what is the partnership thereof uh, with uh, universities and TVET to actually massify these uh, uh, particular programs. Uh, the other one, Chair, is I want to check out of the enterprises being supported, 
which have the potential to be massified domestic. Uh, you have covered me on the issue of uh, the ecosystem. Uh, I, I, I think there's a need of emphasis uh, for this particular innovations. Uh, my other question is with regards to what private sector relations exist to support the innovators, particularly to those that enhance business. Honorable Manani, so can I, can I recommend that you switch off your camera so that we don't lose you? Okay, all right. Can you hear me, my dear? Yes, we can hear you. All right. Uh, so I'm not sure whether should I start what, or you have heard me on other issues. Um, I think we made up, yeah, we made up what you're trying to say, but it was breaking. So you're fine. You can continue. All right. Yeah, I was in the, I was checking with uh, the entities that what private sector relations exist to support the innovators, particularly those that enhance business performance to scale their operations. And Chair, I must say when they were presenting uh, indeed, most of the innovations uh, the situations and they must be applauded. Uh, however, I want to check uh, in terms of what is their monitoring mechanism to those who are beneficiaries and how do they actually check those who have benefited through the services because the nice thing is that on their presentation, they are even giving us numbers, uh, specific numbers of uh, those uh, service product. And uh, if they can just give us as well your demographics as we normally want them in writing to say from this one where there's 40 people benefited, this is the picture and so on. And I'm happy that. Uh, the Memeza issue, it's, it's really one that it's recommendable on the basis that my other question is, I, uh, does TIA have the capacity to support more grassroots innovators and are they linked to incubators or any accelerator programs? Uh, lastly, Chair, what is the constraint of the tax to have its four modes, which are critical for Jenna. That's it from me, Chairperson. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Manani. So, Honorable Masati. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Uh, Shanaz, can I check if you can hear the web? Um, Chairperson, I'm also battling to hear. Colleagues, um, I hope my network will not uh, this. Okay, am I still not on? I think you're breaking up. Chairperson, am I still not audible? I think we can hear you now. Now we okay. can hear. All right, thank you. My uh, my problems are many in Acacia Park. Um, Chair, without wasting any more time, I wanted to really send my gratitude to the department, especially around the disability project that speaks to the innovation around interpreting interpretation or the device that is assisting people with disability in as far as um dealing with issues of home affairs and and you know uh, also putting in cases at police stations that is a very great innovation because one of the critical issues that we are facing with that we are faced with currently is that particular element of our people not being able to put their cases because there are no interpreters 
in, in, in police stations. So I think that is one of the greatest uh, innovations that we have might have come up with in also assisting government to, to, to be efficient in its work. But my critical issue is around the, I'm not sure whether to call it a recruitment uh, or you know, of innovators. How is it done? And whether is it possible for TIA and all other entities working in this particular spaces to begin to identify critical needs, you know, and bank them so that as we, as, as innovators come into these spaces, are already aware of what is the need currently and where would investors be able to pull their money so that we are able to navigate the space and ensuring that, you know, we enhance service delivery. And if they, have, if they haven't done that to bank this um, critical needs for purposes of innovation, how then do they identify um, the needs or do, does the recruitment around you know, innovation just happens, just a young person come with an, with an idea and then they, they, they run with it? Because I think if we were to do that, it will also you know, focus innovators to focus on certain uh, on particular issues so that we don't waste resources and time on things that may not necessarily find expression in as far as your, your financial capital and human resource capital. Secondly, Chair, my concern, though is not necessarily part of the presentation, um, maybe uh, if maybe the department here will be able to respond to it, is to check whether innovations that are not necessarily service delivery driven, are they able to assist? Because when you look at a market, seemingly people who are well known are able to market their products much more quicker than an ordinary South African. I would want to make an example about innovations that are not necessarily service delivery driven, but you know, your hair, your, you know, your, your, your jewelries and so forth and so on. Where you see many celebrities able to, you know, to put their, um, their, products on the market and are able to sell quite quick, quickly. How do we make sure that in our own spaces, we are able to utilize whatever effective way of making sure that the products meet them, that gets into the market much more quicker and they're able to be accepted and appreciated by consumers. Uh, most probably we could check what is the operating modus operandi around those spaces so that our own young people who are not necessarily well known, they can utilize the same method to make sure that their products are sold. The, the very, very last one, Chair, and I think other um, um, colleagues have spoken to it, is the role of the private sector in injection financial resource into these activities and whether do we, our own um, innovations that have come to the fore, are they able to, to, you know, to reach the global market outside the borders of, of our country? Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much, Honorable Matlati, Honorable Mananiso, as well as Honorable Boshov. I think I also had this similar question, you know, when I, when I was asking about um, how we can become intentional about the Northern Cape, I I was short of just asking, you know, how how we how the application process goes, uh, recruitment process, application process, but you know that whole process is seven and I think that's something that um, I want to co ask um, as the work did, um, and then also just trying to understand another demographic. Uh, or data set. Um, just looking at still on slide 10, 
you know, the bulk of our innovations are IT related. And then we have manufacturing coming in, uh, natural resources, no, no, energy, agriculture, natural resources tied with health, and then IKS. And I guess the question, the question becomes, you know, when, when we talk about innovation, Dr. Morfin, this is quite a like a, I don't know, um, theoretical question that I'm asking. Like what, what is innovation? Is, you know, is innovation, what is our appreciation for, you know, so, so when we look at, let's say someone comes in and says they've this, they, they, this is what they're innovating and they'd like to be funded and supported on it. How do we decide that this is an innovation? Um, and then how do we even categorize them to say this is a, because there could be something that is related to agriculture, but is IT. So, or is related to transport, but is IT related to um, uh, health, but yeah, well, so so how do we how do we put uh, how do how do we categorize these innovations to say, you know, they are ICT based, they are IKS, they are. I I remember when I um, I don't know what engagement we were in, and there were, was I in a webinar that the department was hosting, and you know we were speaking about IKS innovation, and I was really trying to understand what what that looks like what does indigenous innovation look like uh, today not in the past and you know so for me it's just uh, it's something i'd like to to understand how you would go about categorizing these <clears throat> these innovations um and then maybe you could even share the database with us maybe you can leave out the name the the numbers of the individual individuals but i think we'd like a spreadsheet because I think in the presentation, of course, you've just highlighted a few of the innovations. So we'd like a spreadsheet to maybe um, assist us in understanding, you know, how we categorize these innovations and what type of innovation would be classified as a natural resource-based innovation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but those are the questions from, from members. Uh, and I think I'd, at this point, I hand over to Dr. Moafe and colleagues to respond. Uh, <clears throat> thanks very much, uh, Chairperson. I'm just going to, uh, first I'll let um, Anita and Tsepang uh, deal very briefly with the questions and then I'll add up where it's necessary. But uh, thanks for the questions and the comments that have been made. Uh, we, some of the issues we need to, to take uh, forward. Uh, Anita? Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, um, honourable committees uh, members, for the for the questions, uh, and I'll, I'll I'll take a several several of them, and I hope my colleague Tsapang would would pick up on some of them as well. So the first question around: uh, Do we exclude uh, Tibet and graduates? No, we don't. Uh, the exclusion is for uh, students that work as a part of a research group because then uh, they are part of a formal innovation group. And our process is a grassroots innovator is not in the formal uh, research system. So we do take students, we do take Tibet graduates, but they should not be part of a formal research group. Uh, the, how do we, how do we uh, recruit these uh, Tibet learners or these, we do have a recruitment strategy uh, uh, which is besides the call, there is roadshows. Uh, we do roadshows in district and municipal level, uh, and we go out to the we go out to the provinces with the roadshows, where we explain the process, we explain what the instrument is to uh, to group of innovators with support from the local structures uh, on the ground. Um, in terms of a tangible plan for uh, supporting uh, the underserved provinces. Uh, we did, uh, we do have that. We released uh, a call uh, for, uh, particularly for underserved provinces uh, in the last, uh, in, in, in this financial year. Uh, but what we found is that even though we released the call, there was a lot of Kauteng uh, applicants, uh, which we didn't discard, but we took the underserved provinces call. 
But what uh, is part of our plan as well is more of these roadshows on the ground uh, in the different languages uh, so that language is not a barrier to innovation. Happy, uh, using our ecosystem enablers, uh, ecosystem players out there uh, to, uh, to bring uh, uh, innovators together so that we could take them through this, uh, take them through this process. Uh, in terms of the questions asked by Honorable Washoff, in terms of uh, the first engagement with TIA and the lead time, uh, we have streamlined our, our process. Uh, it's much easier for the innovators to apply to the, to the program. It's not a typical TIA application. Uh, we've also uh, do assessments. Uh, we do assessments and uh, approvals on a monthly basis. So the lead time is actually four weeks from the time of submission of the completed application up to uh, up to the approval. Uh, and um, that is, uh, the, we, we've been managing that within a four week period. So we've, t we've not, uh, uh, we've, we've looked into that issue that was raised previously and help and, and we've improved on that turnaround time um, so that the valuable innovations don't disappear. In terms of how many, how much more money and how much more can TIA absorb, our current delivery model is uh, is centralized, uh, we and 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 it is manageable. But should we? And but there's definitely a demand uh, out there for innovators who want to come into the program. We will uh, shift our model uh, so that we would be able to cope uh, if there is uh, more funding and we take on more innovators. Uh, through this process, there are different models that we could utilize to make sure that these innovators are being served. In terms of, uh, uh, I, I mentioned the response to the Tibet uh, and university students, we do take them, provided that they are not part of a research group. And uh, we have, uh, we do uh, engagements at uh, with Tibet students. Uh, this program is complemented uh, by the Living Labs program, and the Living Labs program, is, uh, uh, one Living Lab is actually set up at the Tibet College. Uh, there is active engagement with the communities through the Living Labs, so we use the Living Labs as well uh, as part of our recruitment uh, drive. Um, in terms of uh, Honorable Mananiso's uh, questions around Tibets and universities, and how do we ma massify the program? We have through the TIA uh, programs, uh, other TIA programs, for an example, the Seed Fund program, a very active relationship with the University Tech Transfer Office, as well as the technology stations, as well as the Centers for Entrepreneurship at the universities. So through the partnerships with the universities, we are able to, uh, to massify and support the program. Um, there is, uh, the, 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 uh, we acknowledge the need for more private sector engagement. Uh, I think uh, uh, DDG, Tsapang, what we need to do is maybe have a deliberate strategy around private sector engagement and have private sector come in. Currently, the only private sector player we have that has come in with some funding is the SAB Foundation, uh, but there could be more we could do in that area. Um, how do we check uh, in terms of impact uh, and uh, monetary mechanism? So we do have uh, a monitoring uh, uh, and evaluation system uh, for the innovators. Uh, so there's, there's a process there. And when the technologies are developed, there is an, uh, there is an, an assessment of the technology, uh, technology developed. Uh, we will be able to provide the demographics in writing. We can do that uh, to, to, the, to the committee secretariat. Um, and the question around does TIA has the capacity to support and should they not link to incubators and accelerators? We are actually doing that uh, because once the innovators uh, have developed the technology, they are incubated in, uh, in the several of the uh, incubators, both private and uh, public incubators uh, that are available. Uh, through our partnership with uh, Incita and Tourism, we were able to attract additional funding so that we were able to pay uh, for incubation uh, for the for the innovators. In terms of uh, Honorable Atlati's questions around uh, 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 about the recruitment of innovators, and in terms of looking at what are the critical needs, currently our funding uh, in the program 
uh, is mainly focused on technology development. There is a need for providing support for piloting, for demonstration, and for active marketing uh, of the product, both domestically as well as internationally. Uh, we have, uh, we are working on uh, on uh, uh, a revised uh, 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 and expanded program uh, with the department on uh, grassroots innovators, so that we could uh, we could actually look at how we can address these needs that has come through the initial cohort uh, that we've taken into the program, particularly around piloting. Uh, being able to demonstrate, being able to get to international markets to, to market their products elsewhere. Uh, regarding the question around having uh, celebrities and ambassadors to assist, uh, we, take, we, note of that, we take note of that. Uh, innovators themselves are linking themselves to, uh, to uh, ambassadors out there, but they also ambassadors in their, in their, own, uh, in their own way. We have some, uh, some of them that are really making strides but uh, in terms of having it as a, a, a greater uh, mass, uh, we, we would definitely note that and we would definitely uh, consider that. Um, in terms of uh, the chairperson and how do we, uh, how do we decide uh, which is the sector, uh, co correct that uh, some solutions will cross many sectors. Uh, but what we look at is which is the dominant uh, research area when we are indicating that this is either ICT or manufacturing or energy. So we look at that, but definitely they are cross-sectoral uh, projects. Many of them are, for an example, in precision agriculture, uh, you would have uh, an ICT-based agricultural solution. We welcome, uh, we will definitely share the database, the spreadsheet, uh, including the names. Uh, we actually are... Uh, in the process of uh, creating a, a website uh, for the for the program itself, the grassroots innovation program, and we have uh, uh, we, we have a, a, an area where portfolio committee members will be able through a password uh, process be able to look at uh, the profiles, will be able to look at the demographics, etc. Uh, uh, we are eighty percent completed with that process. And as soon as it's uh, completed, we will communicate uh, through the DSI in terms of asking the committee members to uh, to have access to that platform. Uh, I hand over to you, Tsabang. I, I think I've covered most of the questions that I have noted. Thank you. I think you have, Anita. I think you've covered most of the questions. I can just add maybe a thing or two. On the question that was raised about uh, innovations that are non-service delivery and how we can support them to, 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 to be on the market, there, there is a work stream we have started uh, on the GIP, we call it the, the GIP or the Grassroots Innovation Program Enterprise. That work stream would look at uh, the commercial side of these technologies, in other words, how we can involve the private sector more, those who can bring in equity and those who can take um, shares with these uh, tech uh, owners and bring in additional investment. So there is, a, there is an area of work around um, bringing in private sector, but also supporting more in terms of commercialization because they don't have to be about service delivery. They don't have to target municipalities or government. They also have to be a product that can be uh, in the market. And on the Northern Cape province, just to add, uh, it's, it's been a question and the, the DDG as well as the DG has been uh, challenging us to say, how do we uh, massify and uh, have a multiple of interventions like this in the Northern Cape? So we are already uh, thinking about its chair because we are looking at existing initiatives of the DSI in the Northern Cape, for example, the SKA, how can we use that as a hook? And then around the SKA and other existing initiatives like the Living Labs, we've got uh, initiatives also <coughs> supporting um, innovation for local economic development in the Northern Cape. So how do we bring other instruments like this uh, using uh, our existing NCA initiatives that are already on the ground. But what we are learning also is that 
you may have noticed on Anita's presentation when she mentioned that in Ugu and Zululand, we are, we are taking GIP to Ugu and also uh, to Zululand. So which means as part of packaging uh, initiatives to respond to the DDM. Uh, at, the core, at the core of the DDM is also about these social challenges, unemployment. So how can we bring uh, instruments like TADF, uh, GIP as part of the DDM interventions in the, in the, in the Northern Cape? Uh, we are consulting with other departments, uh, uh, Department of Small Business Development. They've been running a, a program, I think, on digital hubs, uh, 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 DTIC, are also running a program on the commercialization of locally developed technologies. We are part of that. So we are looking at ways to combine and offer a, a, a combined package of interventions, but working with these other uh, departments that I've, I've just mentioned. With the universities, a partnership with the universities, uh, we have started the process where we are asking universities and science councils uh, to give us access to IP that is in their shelves. But this should be IP that has got a potential for a product, a market product. And uh, we are engaging and making such IP available to grassroots innovators who may be interested to take that IP forward. But I think we really need to strengthen the relationship between the private sector, the universities, the TVET colleges, the social um, innovators, the business sector, and, and, and researchers. So there are various efforts uh, broadly, as, as I try to explain, but we are taking these um, uh, in phases because we don't have sufficient investment. And we are also, we will have to pilot first and learn and set up uh, processes. Uh, the last question, which was asked about the constraints of implementing all four modes. We, we started with mode one, uh, which is what was presented here, but now we are engaging and rolling out a mode two, but at the back of it will be to pilot and test at a small scale so that we know what could work, what could not work. Uh, the other one is also investment. So we have to use investments that we have for the program for that particular year. So in the, in the year gone by, I think we had an investment allocation for TATF for mode one. So in the coming year, we'll try and have an investment allocation for mode four, uh, which enables government departments to say, we've got the challenge X is the technology that can uh, come through to solve that particular challenge. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, DDG. Yeah. Thanks, Chairperson. I think just to, to wrap up, um, the chairperson made mention of something very important. Uh, you, you, you talked about the ecosystem. And I think that's really where one of the biggest challenge is. Uh, when you look at, if you were to break down some of these applications, when we talk about, for example, how Teng being dominant, it will probably be in, in a whole lot of instances young people that will be coming from your Limpopos, your Pumalanga and so on and so forth, because of the, the ecosystem issues are much better here. Whether you talk about connectivity and access, not only access to, um, to, to, to connection, but also to other opportunities like potential investors and so on and so forth. So, so, so I think we, we, we have to deal with that in there. The one way that we are trying to deal with that I, I need to mention um, is that I think two, uh, maybe uh, two months ago at Tepang, we did uh, make a presentation to our EXCO uh, requesting that we, uh, we make sure that we have at least uh, SMS members of our department deployed in various uh, municipalities or districts. And this is really to ensure that we can actually, in expanding some of the initiatives in support of the DDM model, that we are also able to see and interact with people on the ground and, amongst other things, be able to share the opportunities that are presented by programs such as then hopefully we can, at that stage, be able to, um, to expand because 
everybody who represents a particular district would, would want to make sure that such a district is actually active in, in, in uh, drawing from the um, uh, uh, opportunities that are presented by, by the department. So we are hoping that that will contribute, but also that the provinces and the local governments are also going to, um, and, and we continue to engage them, they are also going to come on board to try and make sure that some of the investments are really made to create and strengthen this ecosystem. I also want to clarify the, the question around uh, universities and uh, science councils, uh, people not necessarily being the main beneficiary here. The issue is not to exclude them. The issue is that those that are involved in research projects at these institutions and they want to commercialize, they already are within an ecosystem. Whereas if I was say a graduate from University of the Witwatersrand or University of Venda or Zululand, and I'm now back in my village, I'm effectively cut out of all the support uh, systems that exist. For example, I cannot on my own uh, access an incubator without having to bear the cost of doing that. So that is really why we then say we target those people who ordinarily wouldn't have access. And then by bringing them into this program, you can then be able to say, okay, do you want to get incubation? This is how we're gonna assist. Do you want to get your uh, prototype developed, say through the technology station? This is how we link you up with it. So that's really the, the main thing. So when they are in their institutions and involved in research, that, that kind of access is there, but as soon as they are cut out, then that's why we, we really come in there. The question about the uh, TVETs has been addressed. I also wanted to, um, to highlight, just to uh, add on the comment regarding uh, Honorable Boshoff's question. The, these programs are special programs, if I may put it that way. And, and, and as Anita said, we sit uh, quite often to look at how to, um, to evaluate and, and despair, disperse as soon as possible. And these are programs that we deal jointly ourselves as a department and as the technology innovation agency team that is responsible for, um, for, 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 for grassroots innovation. There, there are other bigger you know, issues, I mean, like budgets that we transfer to TIA to run their own sort of programs that don't necessarily run jointly between the department and science. Technology. That is really where I think the issue of turnaround times uh, are, being, are being addressed. But here, the, the, the process is quite quick and the engagements are such that we don't burden these grassroots innovators with uh, unnecessary bureaucracy. So it, it's really worked very well. Um, I also uh, would want to, to, to say to uh, the chairperson, I think you've mentioned this and uh, maybe also one or two honorable members that we would really want to, um, to, to, to bring the beneficiaries to, 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 to the presentations. Uh, this time around, I think we might have just mi missed the brief, but definitely it's one thing that we would be very excited to do. And now I take it that after your comments, uh, uh, chairperson and the recommendation, that next time we have to do something like this, it will really be a standard that we at least uh, bring one or two or whatever number that is going to be workable to bring uh, to this meeting so that they can actually speak for, speak for themselves and share with you what um, the, the, their experiences are. Um, so, so, so I think that, that really, for me, is, is one thing that is quite uh, crucial. And, and just a last word on these uh, programs, uh, Honorable Chairperson and members, is that we see these as not as separate uh, initiatives on themselves because the moment you start having one person coming up with memeza and so on, when they grow, they actually are becoming employers. They are gonna employ a few more people into uh, their enterprises as they grow. And, and, and we are quite excited. It has been indicated here, there were questions around growth beyond the borders. We are quite excited that as you might have picked up in some of the slides, there are some that are already having engagements outside uh, of the Southern borders to expand there, to make an impact. And as they expand, obviously, um, they actually are able to grow their own revenue streams and so forth. So in that regard, there are also other mechanisms that are lined up to, to support them. You may or may not be aware that we, uh, I think around uh, 
July, around May this year, we actually jointly launched a, a program that was covering uh, uh, other SADC countries uh, in partnership with the small, small Business Development Department, where we are beginning to grow uh, opportunities for entrepreneurship for young people, uh, not only in South Africa, but also growing into the region. So, so those are some of the um, programs or platforms that these entrepreneurs can easily jump into uh, and, and have access to, to, to markets outside of the, the country. So um, I'm, 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 you will advise the chairperson if we have uh, missed any, any, any question and then we'll, we'll, we'll deal with it. Uh, but we, we, we are more than ready to, to take advice. You also have noticed also that a lot of this will be in the ICT area. And one of the reasons why ICT is quite exciting for young people is that there isn't really a lot of um, uh, upfront capital that is required when we deal with uh, IT innovation. So basically you can just be walking around with your mobile phone or with your computer and, and you can get things done. But ultimately um, we will really want to uh, create a system that talks to all areas of the sectors of our economy so that uh, these young people can begin to play in a much bigger role than, than in the ICT. So we do look forward to um, uh, to, to building uh, such such an uh, ecosystem that will cover other economic uh, aspects and to grow the other side of the pie that the um, mini school co co compared to, 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 to the ICT. Thanks very much, Chairperson. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Muafe, um, Anita, and Sapang for your responses. Um, I, I, I must say, um, and sometimes I feel bad for saying this all the time, because now it feels like we, we, we just say it, <laughs> but it's, it is always exciting to interact with yourselves. Um, and really, one would want to see some of the innovations that you've shared with us today, um, making some really great impact in the economy, um, as you've mentioned, in contributing to employment, um, but also in really addressing some of the uh, socioeconomic needs of our communities, um, be them service delivery related or be them issues just generally relating to the daily lived realities of, of our citizens. Um, we look forward to some of the information you'll share with us going forth. And thank you very much for um, that commitment that you've made to trying to make sure that the committee meetings, even though they are virtual, are inclusive and are exciting for us as members. Um, you know, we don't want a situation where members can quote verbatim, um, you know, everything that uh, the department says. We, we do want to, uh, for a lack of a better word, spice things up um, and, and not create, you know, uh, monotony in terms of how, um, you know, our, our engagements go. So really these, these briefings from the beneficiaries uh, from the innovators, from the leads of various programs, um, really does contribute to ensuring that these, in these uh, interactions amongst ourselves remain exciting. Um, but it also does assist us in better understanding, you know, where some of the gaps are. Uh, I'm sure even when you, when you listen to the innovators present you, you and present their, their successes and, you know, their ongoing challenges, you also are uh, re, I don't know, um, informed, uh, reminded of, of, you know, where some of the, or, in, or uh, enlightened on some of the areas of focus that we need to be zooming into um, as the various uh, stakeholders that are responsible for uh, supporting this grassroot in, these grassroots innovations. Um, I don't want to say much more because I think in, by and large there's agreement um, of course, I think Shanaz and honorable members, I think when we do have more of these engagements, um, even if we see, even if we could say, Dr. Mofa, we smuggle in some of these programs or uh, beneficiaries to present. During, I mean, the eight, when I think of, for example, the annual, annual performance plan sessions with the DSI, they, they aren't long, you know. So we could even see how we smuggle in some of the beneficiaries there. Um, you know, so so we'll see as the year goes by, because this is our second last engagement. We'll see how we um, going into next year, 
how we can, can incorporate more of that, even particularly with um, some of the stakeholders, some of the partners that you've listed as well in the presentation, some of those that we have spoken to. But uh, let's continue to do the great work that um, we've been doing, colleagues, let's strengthen it. Impact, 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 uh, impact, inclusivity, impact. Um, that's really what becomes important for us. So having said that, honorable members, I would like to lobby us to adopt minutes next week. We definitely will have to adopt all minutes and all reports that are outstanding before the end of the year. So by next week, I trust most of us would, would have read through all the reports and minutes that um, would have captured the, the rest of the year or you know what is left of our year. And so can we please do that next week? Um, we have a committee meeting with NASFAS on the report on maladministration as well as VUT, um, stemming from our engagements with VUT, UNISA, MUT, and I'm leaving out one institution, UCT. Um, so so we, we've lifted VUT as an institution that we'll meet with now. And of course, we said with the others, we'll meet them as, as, as next year goes by. Um, and th that meeting will be a physical meeting um, uh, in Mark's building. And we will try our best between, you know, over the next couple of days to try and figure out how to, to make the meeting inclusive, but members are encouraged to come physically. Uh, and of course, we will try and figure out a way to include those that might not be able to attend physically, but the meeting is physical. It will be on Wednesday. Um, right, so having said that, honorable members and colleagues, this meeting at 10.47 has come to an end. We wish you a restful weekend. Thank you very much. Recording Yay. stopped. Thank you, Chairperson, and thank you, honorable members. Thank you. Goodbye.